You here? You're here? Okay. Very good. So Baron Koch is the general manager for energy automation applications at uh, Siemens Smart Grid in Germany. And you'll speak about the smart grid solutions for optimal renewable integration. Bernd, thank you very much. Yes, good morning from my side as well. Um, chief part of the smart grid, and uh, my, my, my personal impression was looking at the patents is pretty important because this is uh, more a securing business for the future. So very important view on that. Uh, and I'm happy to visit you on your booth. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a main issue which is uh, mainly uh, an, of interest uh, in many countries in Europe, which is uh, caused by a thing which we call renewable integration uh, based on uh, installation of uh, uh, decentralized generation in mainly low and medium voltage grids, which is a new situation uh, overall to the, to the network. Uh, so the overall trends of that is, uh, of course, we all want to uh, become more sustainable, and especially in Germany, uh, I think you're all aware of that, uh, there is a program started uh, to ramp down the nuclear power plants, and there has to be sort of a replacement for that, and uh, uh, to an extent as much as possible coming out of renewable energy and not uh, out of uh, other fossil generation. So that's the mainstream political target we are following. Um, so we have, uh, moreover, also increasing loads in the low-voltage grids. There are some uh, e-cars coming up, uh, which is a new situation, uh, and some, some more consumers, they are uh, connected to the grid. Uh, and, uh, of course, there is globally seen, uh, there are aging infrastructure as well, so the networks are, as we just heard in the first presentation, very cost-effective when they are old. Uh, and uh, as cost-effective is uh, sort of a business target, uh, there is no real push of changing the networks if there is uh, no additional benefit. Uh, so looking at these, uh, there are different customer challenges that we have to meet, uh, and mainly all of them. Uh, an isolated uh, look at one challenge only is not really putting the benefit uh, to the customer. We have to address more or less uh, all the set of this. Uh, so the overloads in the distribution grids have to be managed uh, because this really is putting threat on, on the networks, physical threats on it. Um, the cost of, of this has to be managed in order to stay as profitable as, as, uh, uh, as possible. Uh, currently, there is only limited, uh, uh, limited transparency on the low voltage grids and to some extent on the medium voltage grids as well as sort of a matter of fact. And uh, mainly the distribution grids are not really designed for bi-directional load. And I just give you an example here. You possibly have seen this before. This is the load curve um, of a transformer, 11 kV to, to uh, 400 volts uh, in the southern part of Germany, uh, which I think is pretty well known as one of the photovoltaic uh, pioneers uh, worldwide. We have uh, many, many installations on rooftops and on, on, on smaller uh, PV plants, uh, more or less distributed all over Bavaria and, uh, and uh, Baden-Württemberg and the southern part of Germany. So this has been the load curve, which is uh, which pretty okay. So um, there is a supply going into the low voltage grid and the low voltage grid is, is consuming uh, the energy. Uh, that was 2003. Uh, if you look at 2011, this has changed dramatically. So first of all, uh, we have peaks here, and these peaks are in, in the negative sense, so there is a feedback from the low voltage grid into the medium voltage grid. That's wonderful, that's a changed situation. The other thing that has changed is, uh, if you look at the amplitude, that's the next thing that has changed. Uh, this transformer had to deal with uh, a capacity uh, 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 transforming roughly less than 100 kilowatts. And this has now changed, at least in the peaks, to more than 250. So this is another change. Uh, and the third thing that has changed is uh, not really the physics, but it's more the business model. Uh, usually, the DSO s sold energy to a consumer in the low voltage grid. And now he's getting back energy from the low voltage grid. And what to do with this business-wise? So that's the third aspect of that. Um, and in order to have a really a solution to it, we have to address all these issues. So coming back to the physical uh, constraints, this is a more schematic picture now. Um, 
The situation is we now have uh, infeed coming from renewables uh, in an area of the grid where it wasn't uh, designed to. And this comes up to different challenges. Uh, if I start at the high voltage level, of course, there is uh, to some point, and we have measured this in Germany at in some ex uh, extremely hot days in the summer, there is a feedback from the medium voltage grid into the high voltage grid. Now, currently, this is not really a problem. Uh, the transmission lines are very well protected. Uh, there is a high transparency on what is going on there. All the transformers used are, are switchable transformers, though currently the networks can live with this situation. This changes a little bit if you go in the medium voltage area. M many, many DSOs have invested in the last years in, into, into uh, SCADA systems and, and control centers in the medium voltage area, so there is sort of a transparency in the network, but what is not given is there are, there are no tr switchable transformers normally. They are just uh, designed without any switches, so potentially you see the problem, but you cannot solve it. And it's even worse in the low voltage grid, there is no sensor at all, so it's the dark area, so you do not even know what's going on there. And this, of course, is uh, again increased, uh, for example, by having uh, uh, electrical cars there. You generate energy in one area, and it's used in the other one. It's not even seen in this, uh, which is, of course, a problem for uh, any protection schemes. Because, uh, there, there is no real protection scheme currently in the low voltage grid. So what we propose here is, uh, first of all, uh, to start measuring. Uh, what is needed is to have sensors in the low voltage grid, uh, which is not a full-blown uh, scope of protection, but at least you have to come up with uh, some sensors. Uh, these sensors are distributed in the medium voltage grid as well in order to really find out what is the current situation in the network, including the low voltage grid. And there is no need uh, to, to uh, implement it on, on every single home. Um, there is a huge potential, by the way, by having smart meters. If smart meters are there, they can be used uh, in order to increase the transparency. So this is an additional benefit of a smart meter if it's already, th already there. Uh, the, the, the analytics are dynamic now. Uh, usually they used to be static. There was a static planning scheme. The network was built. The copper was uh, uh, built in, and then it worked. This has changed, this is going to be dynamic in the future because if you are really exact, the network changes whenever there is a new rooftop installation of a, of a, of a PV. Uh, so this is going to be dynamic more or less from now on. And finally, of course, you have to take action. Uh, this means sending out set points in order to control the situation in the low voltage grid. Um, uh, to manage the loads, uh, to come up with some uh, uh, optimized protection schemes. And finally, if you have the situation uh, there in a controlled way so that you're not running into physical problems, then of course this is the opportunity of start uh, having trading of this energy, which is energy, energy in excess, and uh, earning additional money from that. And mainly what we see if you, if you have uh, really address this about the renewable integration, which we think is feasible, but difficult from the rollout scheme, because uh, as we heard in the presentation before, this is quite a lot of money and a lot of work needed to do that. Um, what is possible to use uh, software implications from the marketing point of view, which we see as one is demand response and the other one is uh, virtual power plant. Now, what is the difference? Uh, demand response schemes normally are turning loads off. Uh, this could be done uh, less or more intelligent, but mainly the basic idea is uh, getting a flexible load in order to uh, and, and, and automate this, so in order to be flexible from the load point of view. Uh, a virtual power plant is really optimizing uh, the whole situation, N not only having load in mind, but also, also the distributed uh, generation and potentially the storage. Uh, to some extent, uh, batteries, of course, are storage, but we are thinking of more than that. Uh, so heat storage as well uh, is a very uh, interesting alternative to that because uh, I think you are aware of that uh, currently huge size batteries are not really uh, uh, easy to get, so they are pretty complicated uh, and they are quite expensive currently. So looking a little bit in the detail what, uh, what demand response is, uh, from our point of view, the only real solution are automated demand response programs. We have seen some of these programs in the US coming up using call centers. 
they are more or less pretty slow. Uh, and uh, the reliability of switching the load off is, is pretty limited because you call your partner, the, he, he is going or he or she is going there, putting uh, a switch and then it's uh, turned off. But if he forgets something, you get not the effect that you wanted. So really what is needed is an automated process and uh, the advantage that you get is you are much faster and the demand response programs are then able to have uh, uh, shareable loads in, a, in an area of about five to ten minutes, which is not possible using call centers for us. And then it be really begins having commercial value because you can use this as a quick response to a change in the generation side. Um, in order to do that, uh, there has to be a definition of so-called uh, DR programs. You have to define set points and the rest then is done automatically. Uh, very importantly, the feedback loop, so the control really has the load gone, gone out of the network uh, is necessary and this again is where, where metering has, has a big impact. Reading back the smart meters and having sort of a control function whether this really worked uh, is very uh, important uh, and we imported this in, into uh, a demand response management system in order to have an automated billing and of course to have a sort of a, a, a guaranteed success in the end. And there are several key issues to demand response programs. Um, one is, of course, you have different programs. So you can really look at the peak demand, but you can support, of course, uh, time of use uh, uh, tariffs as well. This is pretty flexible, has to be engineered uh, and customized because this is really dependent on what the customer wants to achieve. Um, Another very important uh, issue is the baseline. Of course, uh, the effect of a demand response program always is measured against the baseline. What would have happened if I wouldn't have done anything? That's the important question. And there are quite a lot of different scenarios. Uh, typically, load curves are different uh, summertime and wintertime. They are different between weekdays and, and uh, weekends. So it's not only one baseline. You have to have uh, a more intelligent baseline calculation to have a fair uh, evaluation of, uh, of the program. Uh, and of course it has to be sort of open. Proprietary protocols is not really a helpful solution. Uh, it has to be sort of an open architecture so that you can aggregate uh, different uh, participants uh, and therefore we are focused on, on using uh, open protocols like open ADR for example, which uh, we see as one of the uh, standards that are just uh, about to raise coming from the US mainly. So that oh, was a bit, little bit fast. The uh, next step in this uh, in the solution portfolio is a virtual power plant, which is combining the generation as well as storage elements. And this is just a picture to give you sort of an overview what sort of participants could be uh, uh, partners of a so-called virtual power plant. The virtual power plant itself uh, currently is designed to do several things. It can do uh, a load balancing in order to optimize a load curve. Uh, it can be used as an aggregation of distributed energy resources because it doesn't make much sense for trading uh, a, a one megawatt generator. You have to aggregate different smaller size uh, generation units to have a bigger one in order to be tradable. Uh, and then, of course, there are different markets. Uh, in Germany, we have tertiary and secondary markets. Uh, this is, to some extent, comparable. It's not exactly the same. So again, this needs adaptation uh, to the actual situation. So what is needed in order to do this? Of course, you need load forecasts. Uh, there is a scheduling needed. Um, there has to be a forecast of the renewable generation, which in the end is sort of a weather forecast. Uh, and an automatic generation control. Because, uh, whenever you have some manual action in this uh, very complicated system, you are more or less too slow. So there, and there are different different use cases. Uh, when you are participating in, in, in different markets, uh, you have to facilitate uh, the participants in order to be tradable. Uh, the customers here are aggregators and utilities. In some countries, there are aggregators already. In other countries, not. This is done by the utilities. Um, and again, it's a difference whether you are in a regulated or a deregulated market. So this is uh, a challenge. Uh, so there needs to be flexibility in the in the solution offering, uh, which has to be finalized uh, customer by customer. 
uh, optimization of fleet management, uh, and of course, uh, ensure uh, the compliance with the fleet schedule is, is very important because you are in a, in a generation scope from that point of view. Uh, the customers here are operators with large units combining uh, together with small units. This is a very big challenge because th normally these uh, companies are used to run bigger scale uh, power plants. Uh, and this is uh, really the challenge to feed into these very strict regulations. Um, and of course the optimization of the energy cost, uh, this is uh, using uh, design of a load curve, for example, for an industrial customer. When you are able to design your load curve, uh, you are able to um, have better contracts with your energy supplier and gain uh, more money out of that. And this is how it would work. Uh, you have different inputs, uh, and first of all, very important is there is always a contract. All these solutions are based on contracts. Uh, and you can fulfill the contract and use all the data which is available in order to generate, first of all, reduction in energy consumption, but as well, increased flexibility. And the increased flexibility is going to be more and more important. This is how we see it. Uh, um, and this finally is putting putting down your energy bill. So just to give you some examples, um, I've picked one uh, from the portfolio element, which uh, this is this is called Irene. This is the southern part of, of Germany, uh, where this renewable integration is put together. This is, uh, there are two or three smaller towns. Uh, they are producing about three times more energy than they need. Uh, this is controlled by uh, what we call a microgrid manager and the renewable integration scheme. Uh, we are controlling rooftop PVs, uh, uh, some two biogas uh, power plants, uh, and there is a there is a medium-sized battery installed to optimize this and to have a stable grid uh, without uh, uh, without the, the physical problems that I just mentioned. There is a switchable uh, transformer installed, uh, and there has been a prototyping using 40 e cars in one street so that you have really the situation, if everybody has a uh, has an e-car, what does this mean to the grid? So this was originally really in, in one street, 40 cars. Um, having in mind the virtual power plants, as I said, uh, they are connected to different, uh, different consumers. Uh, we have a project running in Malmö in, in, in Sweden with E.ON, um, where the virtual power plant is optimized uh, in order to increase uh, the infeed of uh, a windmill. So whenever there is wind, we use this one. Whenever there is no wind, we try to use what is stored in the building. And this is where smart buildings play an important role. Whenever there is a building management system in, in a larger scale building, all this flexibility of the building can be used uh, to stabilize and optimize the grid. This is a very important uh, part of uh, a smart grid from our point of view. And finally, in Munich, uh, the municipality of Munich uh, is bundling uh, their, their uh, backup generation. There are six diesels uh, aggregated together and additionally five hydropower plants and the windmill run as one big backup diesel which can be used for trading but is actually used uh, in order to optimize the heating of uh, public swimming pools to have a more or less a flat curve um, uh, from the DSO to the to the TSO, which uh, increased um, the value of these assets for for uh, the municipality of Munich uh, to a huge extent, and they are quite happy uh, with the system and uh, planning to further extend. Okay, so I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much, Bernd. There, I already see one question there on the floor. Don't, but I think it's better. Just wait. I, I think it would be better to hear. Okay. I don't know if there's one. We need a microphone, please. Pretty simple question. Have you done, and I'll repeat it for the microphone if there's a recording needed. Uh, have you done a look at what these large pit, you know, 100? Uh, on, the, on, the low, on the low power side of the, the grid, have you done an analysis of length of life of what these kinds of uh, uh, magnitude shifts with this input coming from solar uh, may do to the length of life 
of uh, these networks? Um, look, look, looking at, at the copper, uh, uh, the copper itself is not really sensitive into what direction the current is flowing. So mainly the, uh, the challenge is that you have to uh, compare, is this within the safety margin or is it not within the safety margin? Uh, if it's not within the safety margin, you are immediately in trouble because the, uh, the cables are going to heat up. Yeah, and this is, this is, of course, reducing the lifespan quite massively, uh, and there is a risk of, of getting them burnt. Um, on the other hand, from the transformer point of view, uh, there had been assessments what this means uh, for the overall lifespan, uh, which has been done by our colleagues uh, from, the, from the transformer business. So there is a reduction. Um, mainly it is dependent on, uh, of course, the number of incidents, uh, but moreover uh, for, for the time period. Only short peaks is not that much of a problem. Uh, longer uh, situation is then worse. And what, what we see, if you compare it 2011 to 2012 and 2013, uh, the number of PVs is increasing still quite rapidly. So it's, it, it's not only that uh, the peak is going to be even further down in this, in this uh, uh, diagram, but it's also to be extended. We have it more often. It starts sooner and it lasts longer. So it's, so it's binary, you're saying. If it goes outside the range of tolerance, it does have an impact. But if it doesn't go outside the range of tolerance, even if it frequently approaches the range of tolerance, it has zero impact. I wouldn't really say zero because it's, it's done in, 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 the, uh, in the other direction, but it's, it's pretty limited. Yeah. But mainly just to give you an example, uh, why I don't think this is a realistic case. Uh, in Germany, there is a planning guideline. Every residential building has to be planned with a roughly about a four kilowatts load. Uh, if you look at the kilowatts that these people put on the rooftop, this is something between seven and 10 kilowatts. So you are exceeding the planning rules. And of course, there is a safety margin in this, in this planning, uh, but not really a factor of two or three. So, so definitely the peak and the negative point is going to be bigger than it was originally designed. At least this is true for Germany. So I know the planning rules. I, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll add some more detail later on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it fits quite well because we will start now the Q&A session. So first of all, thank you very much again, uh, Bernd. And I would like also